Well, welcome back and thank you for joining me again this afternoon. Uh, today's an exciting day. We're in Acts chapter 2 and the day of Pentecost, which many people consider is the birth of the church. Of course, you and I know better because we've been following our Bible overview and this theme of God's church all the way from the book of Genesis. We know that throughout the whole Old Testament, God has been gathering a people to himself in order to bring blessing to all the nations of the world. What we do have here today in Acts chapter 2 is the next big important milestone in the slowly unfolding picture of God's plan. And so it is very important and there's heaps of application for us. And so we're going to just jump right into Acts chapter 2 and find out what is the unique contribution of Pentecost to the unfolding plan of God to gather people to himself. Well, let's have a look. This story would be familiar to you by now, I'm sure. Uh, Jesus has ascended into heaven. The apostles are gathered in Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit descends down and empowers them to speak the wonder of God in tongues. Now, this is not ecstatic speech. This is recognizable, known languages. And we know that from verses 5 and 6. We're told in verse 5 that staying in Jerusalem, there were God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And a few verses later, Luke goes into great detail, telling us exactly where all these people were from. And then in verse 6, we read that they came together to hear the wonders of God announced in a language they could understand. Now, for you and I who have been following this Bible overview through, uh, we've got some key phrases there, which no doubt gave us reason to pause. In verse 5, we have people from every nation under heaven. And in verse 6, we have people who are gathering together to hear. Now, at least that's got to make us think back to Genesis chapter 12, when God promised that he would gather together people so that every nation under heaven would be blessed. And so what we see here is something that we've been waiting for for a very long time. But when they hear the apostles speaking in tongues, have a look at their response in verse 12. Amazed and perplexed, they asked, what does this all mean? You see, they were amazed at the miracle, but the miracle didn't make things clearer for them. If anything, the miracle just made them more confused. You see, miracles by themselves aren't a great help unless those miracles are explained. And so what happens is that Peter gets up and in answer to their confusion, he preaches a sermon. A sermon is required for this miracle to make sense. And he answers their question. And we're going to look at the, the sermon in just a moment. But jump to the end, verse 36. Because in verse 36, you get Peter's final answer, the conclusion to the question that they asked to begin with. What does all this mean? And in verse 36, the answer is, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. You see, what defines the gathering of God's people who are full of his Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. What defines the gathering of God's people who are full of his Holy Spirit is that they boldly proclaim that the crucified Christ is Lord of all. That's the message of Peter's sermon and that's the message of the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 is not about miracles. Acts chapter 2 is about testimony. The testimony that God's people will gather together around his crucified and risen Christ. And that God's people who gather together around Christ will be boldly empowered by his Holy Spirit to speak that news to the nations. And this is the big contribution of Pentecost to our unfolding uh, timeline of God's story of his church. 
And that is that no longer will God's people be gathered apart from the nations, like Old Testament Israel always were. Now, with the events of Acts chapter 2, God's people will be gathered from the nations and amongst the nations. And you really get a sense of that if we pop back to the beginning of Peter's sermon and see how he used the quote from the prophet Joel. It's chapter 2, verse 17. Uh, Turn back to your Bibles and have a look. Uh, Peter quotes from Joel, the Old Testament book, and the prophet that bears his name, its name. And this is what he says. In the last days, God says. So I'm going to stop there straight away. Already, that tells us something. It tells us that the prophet Joel, all the way in the Old Testament, was anticipating a time which would be the beginning of the last days. And Peter says, with the death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus and the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, that is what we now have. He says, from this moment, we are in the last days. The last days is when God's Holy Spirit comes down, people gather together around the crucified and risen Christ, and that message is proclaimed to all the nations. This is one of the final events in God's unfolding plan of salvation. And it begins right here. Okay, so in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Now that's significant too, because we've seen that no longer is the gathering of God's people restricted to one nation or one culture. In other words, no longer do you have to first become Jewish before you become become part of God's people. Now, that invitation is open to everyone. And you see it again reinforced in verse 21 at the end of the quote. Joel concludes, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, from Pentecost forward, you no longer have to be a Jew to become a Christian. All the nations of the world now have direct access through the crucified and risen Messiah to come straight to God. And God will now draw near to all nations who come and respond to Jesus directly. No longer is the nation of Israel going to be the mechanism through which God will be mediated to people and through which people must be mediated back to God. And then finally in verse 17, in Joel's prophecy, he says, In the last days I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Prophecy, visions, dreams. It's all the Old Testament language for revelation. You see, Joel was looking forward to a day when God would finally and fully reveal his plan for how he was going to fix a broken world by the gathering of people to himself. And the outpouring of his Holy Spirit, no less. And here at Pentecost, that's exactly what we see. God has now revealed the way. It's not an indication that we must now dream dreams and see visions. I had some pretty wacky dreams last night, which don't bear repeating. I think it's lockdown dreams. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the fact that now all people have had revealed to them the full purpose of God in Christ, to draw together a people at the foot of the cross and through the power of the Holy Spirit to boldly proclaim that message to all the nations. And isn't that wonderful news? That is fantastic. And what a climax for this long unfolding story of God's plan for his church. It's just amazing that we can be a part of it. And I'm so thankful that we live this side of Pentecost rather than before. Well, there's one other thing worth mentioning. And to me, to be honest, it's one of the most exciting because it really connects this episode with an episode that we saw right at the very beginning of our time together. I'm sure you've already joined the dots in your head. Did you notice that the events at Pentecost are completely complement an earlier episode we saw all the way back in Genesis chapter 11 and the Tower of Babel? What we have here is that Pentecost both reflects and reverses the story of Babel. And let me quickly show you how. First of all, it reflects the story of Babel because in the story of Babel, we had God bringing judgment 
through confusing the languages. And what you find here at Pentecost is the exact same thing, that for some people, not all people, but for some people, the apostles speaking in the tongues of all the languages under heaven is a sign of God's judgment. And of course, the people I'm referring to are the nation of Israel. If you were a Gentile on the day of Acts chapter 2, it was no judgment. It was all good news. The wonders of God and the gospel of Jesus get proclaimed in a language you can understand. And the floodgates are open. The top has been blown off God's church. And you are now welcome in. But of course, if you weren't a Gentile, if you were a member of the nation of Israel, then this is bad news. This is a sign of God's judgment. Because the priority and the privilege of Israel is now over. They have forsaken the Lord and they have not responded to the covenant that God made with them. And so from this point on, there is no privilege for the nation of Israel. They must come like everyone else must come, purely at the foot of the cross. And so Old Testament Israel's privileged as a chosen nation ends this day. And the gospel going out in all languages of the nations of the world is proof of that judgment. So in that sense, Pentecost reflects what happened at Babel. But in an even more important sense, Pentecost is the reversal of what happened at Babel. Because at Babel, do you remember what we saw? God scattered people who tried to make a name for themselves. But here in Acts chapter 2, what do you find? You find the reversal of Babel. Because here God is gathering people from all nations so that he can make a name for Jesus. See, when we in our pride try to establish ourselves as an authority over God, make a name for ourselves, God scoffs at our pride and he sends us away. But of course, when time comes for God to announce the gospel and to establish the name of Jesus as his crucified Messiah, who is now Lord of all the universe, then he gathers everyone to him to establish the name of Jesus. And so here we see the wonderful reversal of Babel. God's plan is almost at completion. We are now welcomed in. And our experience is almost complete. Well, I'm going to ask you to read ahead to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22 for tomorrow, our penultimate in our series of afternoon teas. And we're going to see how Paul applies uh, the New Testament church and this wonderful development that we've seen at Pentecost to the everyday life of believers. So please come and join us. I look forward to seeing you again then.